Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Baxter, you wrote that when it comes to energy and environmental issues, the chilling speech is too often the reality. Expand on that, please. I mean, even in kind of civil discourse, people are um, called climate deniers with a clear kind of uh, connection to the Holocaust. Uh, so I think that's inappropriate. It's inappropriate to call for people to be put into jail because they hold views that are different than your own. That seems to, to point honestly to cross the line. It's inappropriate for the federal government to try to go after um, companies for their views or individuals for their views. It's just gotten way out of hand and it's hard to have any type of really any discourse on issues when you're scared to death. And quite honest, and the other thing I include in the written testimony is that there are scientists and people want to do research on some of these important issues that just won't do it because they don't want to commit career suicide. And I, to me, that hurts everybody, not just those people in those careers and, and, and academics, but policymakers are trying to have good information to make informed decisions. You said. Um Federal legislators have urged the Department of Justice to prosecute climate skeptics, including under RICO, uh, and that certain states are getting created to try and prosecute conventional fuel companies. Please expand on that, and if you can, identify um, any of these federal legislators who uh, have urged uh, climate skeptics to uh, be uh, prosecuted under RICO. Yeah, I, I cited that in the testimony, I believe it was Senator Whitehouse was involved in that, and there might have been some other representatives in the House as well. Um, the, the lawsuits that have been actually been talked about in the SLAP context are the, the lawsuits that I'm, some of the lawsuits that I'm talking about as it relates to the states. So like Massachusetts going after fossil fuel companies or, or New York or whatever the states are, or municipalities for that matter. So it's kind of ironic that the things I'm complaining about are actually examples of the strategic lawsuits against public participation that they're using. To me, when the government is going after you and you're a private citizen using the, the existing law that's on the books to protect your right for speech, it just doesn't seem like that's an abuse on the part of these companies. So um, one of the founders of Greenpeace, uh, Dr. Patrick Moore, uh, in an article uh, where he describes why he left Greenpeace, uh, noted that his former colleagues ignored science and supported, uh, spe specifically speaking, of a chlorine ban, uh, forcing his departure because despite science concluding no that there were no known health risks and ample benefits from chlorine in drinking water, Greenpeace and other environmental groups have continued to oppose uh, the use of chlorine for more than 20 years. So when we see the chill that comes uh, the almost anti-scientific and uh, censorship that you're referring to. What does that do for the overall health of human beings and the advancement of science to protect the environment and our communities? Well, it hurts it. Um, and what what really is concerning is that the administrative state and the regulators, who are actually making the policies that impact all Americans are not actually using, are using junk science, and there's no transparency as it relates to the science that's being used. So the American people and, other, and outside experts are not able to evaluate the studies that are being used by federal officials to make decisions. And instead what happens is their efforts to basically reach a policy outcome and the cherry pick studies ultimately to kind of get to that policy outcome. That doesn't do anybody a, a, a good service regardless of what view you have on the issue. So, you know, I can't help as I, as I read this and I read your remarks and some of the other remarks and having watched this for some time, I, I can't help but think of Thomas Kuhn and his discussion of paradigm shifts. With science, um, the, the new theory that which will become orthodox is always at some points heterodox. To the rest of the scientific system. And when you basically attack any scientist who may be looking at something or questioning, that's, that's really what science is all about, whether it's social science or hard, any of the hard sciences. And, and uh, the reality is 
Um, how does this um, censorship, this attack on those who may be heterodox today, which actually may become orthodox tomorrow, how does it prevent advancement in science? Well, the scientists are never going to challenge the alleged conventional wisdom. They're, they're scared to death from doing so. The academic research is, uh, got, has all kinds of problems with peer review processes, um, academics not being able to replicate studies, people not wanting to kind of reach, to do certain research that would in any way jeopardize their career. So you kind of wind up, the, the government relies on junk science and then it just kind of continues, becomes the conventional wisdom over and over and there's never gonna be a challenge of it. And policy that's informed by that science ultimately continues and what we need to have is kind of an ongoing regular system in place so that we can challenge the major studies in science that's informing the policy decisions made by agencies. So they were always um, able to challenge that conventional wisdom. You know, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just have one last quick question. Please. I apologize, but, but it gets to actually even the notion of where federal grants go to study, uh, what items are going to be studied. Because we, and I'll, I'll just summarize, and then you can agree or disagree. Because it seems to me that we churn. We keep sending new grant, we keep sending new grant money to basically re in, reinvent the wheel, or not reinvent the wheel, to actually re buttress whatever the foundational science that we're, that's there instead of actually advancing the science and moving forward. Because if you'd never move to a heterodox position and allow heterodoxy to actually go forward and actually challenge the orthodoxy, uh, no matter how outlandish it may seem, you will never, uh, never change another advance. Would you just comment on that? Yeah, I, I agree with that point, and I think one of the things that needs to be evaluated is just take a look at probably how little science or any research dollars are going to challenge this kind of conventional wisdom. Very little, if any. Thank you very much.